Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the second epistle to the Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last video, we were in uh, chapter 12. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunities that you continue to give us to just come together and feast upon your word we give you all the, the praise the glory and the honor i just ask that you would open our eyes to see open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to, to see the hope of our calling that you would continue to guide us and to teach us and to direct us we know that you love us we just ask that you would filter out all that which is not of you which is of the flesh which is that which is carnal that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts the truth of thy word. For it is in Christ's name I pray. Amen. In our past studies, we've been looking at uh, what one might call Paul's apologetic. I have uh, suggested to you all that since the word of God was not complete at this time, the Apostle Paul represents the Word of God to the believers at Corinth. There obviously had been others in the fellowship there at Corinth uh, in some kind of preaching or uh, proclamation that was contrary to the thesis of God's Word. I do not believe that, uh, that we should be in in looking at the chapter that we should see uh, those kind of apostolic miracles that, that might be presented in the chapter, but uh, rather that we ought to see that Paul was God's representative to them as the word uh, uh, is to us today. And that in this chapter, in the last two chapters, we see uh, in the Holy Spirit's presentation of Paul and his ministry, a presentation of the Word of God. I believe that we're looking at the vindication of God's Word in these chapters. We were up to verse 11, uh, the 11th verse, I have become foolish in boasting, however you compelled me. And what we have seen in the chapter is what the Holy Spirit has had Paul call his boast so that they might contrast his activity with the activity of those who profess to be Christ ministers, but in fact are not. And we've been looking at that contrast in this 12th chapter. By the time we get to the 11th verse, Paul says, I've become foolish, but you compelled me because I should have been commended by you you know if you had actually looked at the facts what has been said in these chapters would not have been necessary i should have been commended by you for in no way was i less than the super apostles even though i myself be nothing and folks i think it is crucial if we are to understand the passage of scripture at all that we do not deify or glorify Paul, that we do not make him some super individual, but we should try to be uh, more conscious, consciously aware of the fact this is the Holy Spirit, uh, that he's, Christ is the message, not Paul. Otherwise, we've humanized the passage. Paul is nothing. Uh, and now we're looking at signs and wonders and... Uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So Paul is nothing but a tool in the hands of God uh, used as the Word of God at this particular time. He says that the signs of an apostle were wrought in him, and it's those signs that many people look for today. That word wonder, uh, that might be the word that you would uh, rather translate as miracle. And so, I, and so I think it's important that we put the word in its proper biblical perspective. 
It is the popular opinion that somehow in the religious area there are things which are miracles used to impress people. In fact, to bowl people over with the, the spiritual authority and the power of the message, and that's not the use of miracles in the Word of God. People always want something uh, wonderful, something marvelous, some kind of uh, titillating experience which they can see rather than the steadfastness of Jesus Christ. Even though, even though the Bible is a book of miracles, honestly, there, folks, there aren't many in it. And it doesn't take much intelligence to realize that God used miracles to vindicate His Word in His messenger. However, the use of that kind of thing ceased when the Word became complete. This is, uh, there's no longer any necessity for a, a Paul or for, a, for you or I uh, for that matter, to be vindicated because we have the complete Word of God. We're looking at a time here where they did not. And I think it's crucial that we see that. I think it is absolutely wonderful how God has preserved His Word and carried it on and translated it. Scriptures have been translated into literally thousands of languages. No other works have done that. The most translated work in all of history separate from the scriptures, are the works of Bill Shakespeare. Maybe that's a, a bit familiar. Some 300 languages, but that pales in, in significance compared to the scriptures. Not only have the scriptures been translated into well over a thousand languages, they've been retranslated hundreds of times. People aren't retranslating William Shakespeare. You know, once it's translated into German, it's a finished transaction, but, but not so when it comes to the Scriptures. They have not only been translated into over a thousand languages, but they've been retranslated in some cases hundreds of times. I find it very interesting that the longest telegram that was ever sent was the revised standard version of the New Testament. First words ever sent over the telegraph. A portion of a verse of scripture. It was sent on May the 24th of 1844. The first message, What hath God wrought, was sent by telegraph. Numbers 23, 23. But times have certainly changed. The first message sent through the internet was L-O. They, they intended to, to transmit the word login, but the system crashed just after they had sent the first two letters. You know, uh, my point is that the scriptures has, has had a tremendous influence in literature, uh, in our legal system, in our business community, in our social life, in our history, uh, our People have died for their attempts to preserve this book or to translate it. The most meticulous care in all of the world has been used in translating and recording and preserving this book. There are situations after situations that almost defy imagination on how the Word of God is presented. There are those who have declared that in their lifetime they would see it stamped out. Well, those people are long dead. And nothing has ever even held a candle to the amount of printing effort, uh, publishing effort, and shipping effort in the literary field that compares with the Word of God. So the signs and the wonders and the mighty deeds are there. They, they might have been in your eyes more wonderful uh, when Paul, you know, could touch someone's uh, handkerchief or, or whatever he might have done and, and heal the disease. Well, that is what people want today. You know, surely most humans would, uh, would probably trade any kind of spiritual healing for some physical healing for, 
you know, some absence of sorrow for some financial security. You know, what a sad commentary on the finished work of Christ. Surely men like the Apostle Paul were surrounded by those who most eagerly anticipated some kind of miracle, some physical healing, physical well-being, and they had no concern whatsoever, dearly beloved, for the message. I think it's absolutely apparent in the Word of God that Paul's primary commission was not running around performing miracles, but was in fact a faithful presentation of the Word of God that was attested to by signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. Now personally, I think those mighty deeds were the ones referred to earlier in the chapter. Mighty in the fact that in Paul's helplessness and his weakness, God preserved him and used him in a mighty way. I do not believe it's any testimony to Paul to realize that he evangelized an area that, that exceeded over one million square miles with no airplane, no automobile, no horse, no telegraph, no radio, no TV, no internet, no large offerings, no visible support. I don't believe that the Word of God needs any defense, folks. All one needs to do is look at it openly, honestly, before God, and it bears all of the marks of inspiration of the power and the authority and, uh, of the Word of God. I do not mean in any way to, to downgrade the ministry of apologetics, but I am suggesting that if there, if there is an area where apologetics is effective, it's with believers, not unbelievers. I don't think that the area of apologetics has anything to do at all with unbelievers. Your responsibility is not to argue him into thinking that this is God's Word, but rather to present its truth in steadfastness and in patience. We preach the gospel and we leave the results up to God. Is there any way, verse 13, in which the church at Corinth was inferior to any other churches? No, absolutely not. There wasn't any difference in this fellowship from any other fellowship with the one exception that I was not a burden to you. And I simply apologize if you consider that to be a wrong. Now, I want you to look at the verse, folks, very carefully. I do not believe that the verse indicates that Paul took pay from every congregation except Corinth. In 1 Corinthians, he, he pointed out that he had a burden, a stewardship, a commission from God in which he did not take pay for his ministry. Now, I think we have to be very careful when we handle the Word of God that, that we not handle it deceitfully. And I'm not going to sit here and say that, that the Word is never handled deceitfully here. I'm not immune from that difficulty. In the way in which it is handled deceitfully, you have the right to judge to protest, to make sure that it's straightened out. I can simply tell you from the bottom of my heart that I do not want to handle this book deceitfully. I don't think Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians that he doesn't take pay from any congregation just to say in 2 Corinthians that what he meant in 1 Corinthians was any congregation by any congregation, he meant Corinthians. That, that he, he did, in fact, take pay from other groups. I don't think in this verse he is refuting what he pointed out in 1 Corinthians. I believe a principle is laid down here that is basically a spiritual principle. I'm not suggesting that what is presented in 1st and 2nd Corinthians is, is, is that the ministry should be unpaid. That's not my point. I think to uh, extrapolate from this some kind of theory that, 
uh, biblically uh, ministry should not be supported is wrong. That's going beyond what's written. However, I strongly urge that you recognize that Paul, according to the Holy Spirit, not according to Paul, but according to the Holy Spirit, Paul was a prototype of how all who should hear and hereafter believe, how that they would believe. Secondly, Paul was used by the Holy Spirit to complete the Word of God. Therefore, in the epistles, Paul primarily represents the doctrinal content of God's Word. I think to suggest that, you know, there's probably a few things Paul wrote that he didn't understand is virtually deifying Paul. Folks, I doubt that he understood much of what he wrote. I don't have any idea how deep his understanding was, how deep his, his enlightenment was at all. What he wrote is what God carried him along to write. What I really want you to see is that Paul is a representation of God's doctrinal content. He is Christ's representative used by God Almighty to complete this book. And I believe that a spiritual principle is that that is, that is not burdensome. Well, Pastor, how can you say that it's not burdensome? Because, you know, nobody uh, ever had any responsibility to produce God's Word. You know, you might translate it, you may carry it, you, you can carry it, you can translate it, you can deliver it, you may proclaim it, but never did God put any burden on you to produce it. Now, it may have, may have been a tremendous burden to Paul, that the Holy Spirit was using him to pen the epistles. I believe God, the Holy Spirit, is saying that that was never a burden placed on you, never once. I don't believe that the principle involved is that ministries shouldn't be supported. If a pastor compromises what he believes in order to increase his income, that's wrong. But because that evil exists, that's not a reason that a congregation can't hire a pastor. Not at all. The thesis is that God has never burdened us as his children, as members of his family and of his household to produce the word of God. That's never been a burden. It may be a tremendous sense of responsibility and burden to proclaim it, but God gave it freely to you and to me. God completed it without any burden to us. You know, would we feel better if somehow we, we had been a part of the proclamation or the, I mean the, the production of the Word of God? That may be, but that wouldn't improve the truth and the quality of God's Word. I think it's marvelous that God gave it to us. I personally believe that, that most of us here have no idea how precious this book really is to us. You know, we may go all week and never open its covers. You know, we may go weeks and, and never open its covers. But if someone were to suddenly divest you of all your worldly possessions today, I think most of you, at least most of you, at least those of you who are truly members of God's family and household, might be totally amazed at how much you miss this book. And God gave it to us freely, without charge. He did not place any kind of human responsibility upon us. It was without burden, and I believe in that sense, Paul was not a burden to the congregations where, uh, and in which he ministered the Word of God. Surely there were cases where, you know, he took help you know, we, we've already, we, we already saw, we, we already have him admitting in the, in the chapter that there was a case when brethren came from Macedonia, uh, ministered to some of the areas in which he lacked. I'm sure that Paul's physical necessities were relieved on certain occasions by brethren. Uh, but no burden was placed upon any congregation in the proclamation of the word. 
And in that sense, it would be wrong, I believe, for one to suggest that he should follow exactly in Paul's footsteps and not, a, 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 you know, expect a workman to be worthy of support. But in the actuality of that word, God placed no burden upon it. What is it which you were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. What does he, what does he mean by, by this wrong? I believe that's a, an, an, an irony or, or a sarcastic statement. I don't think that the verse is saying, hey, I, I really was wrong there and I'm, I'm asking your apology. I believe that's a, a sarcastic statement rather than saying I'm admitting a mistake. I don't think I made a mistake. He's saying, what is it that you are inferior to other churches? that I myself was not a burden to you. Well, forgive me. He wasn't a burden to any other church. I don't think that he's admitting in verse 13 that he was burdensome to all other churches and, and not to Corinth. I think he's reinforcing what he revealed in 1 Corinthians, that he was not a burden to any congregation. He's already admitted that there, there were cases, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the texts, uh, the grammar would indicate there in, in, I believe in verse 9 of chapter 11, that that is not something that was characteristic of his life. There was a time when he got behind, but I didn't, I didn't burden anybody or I wasn't chargeable to anybody in Corinth. The brethren at Macedonia that one time made it up. I don't think either of, of those passages indicate that he was a burden to any congregation. And I, at first glance, it would seem to indicate that, that he was burdensome to other congregations and not to Corinth. Because apparently there was a, there was a charge made against Paul that he wasn't their proper representative. It's clearly been indicated to us in the last two chapters that whoever these false teachers were, were a burden to the congregation, and Paul was not. Now he's su suggesting there, do you think that, that my normal activity with other congregations is that I was burdensome to them? Are you inferior? that I was burdensome to other congregations and not to you. I think the whole tenor of the passages, uh, of this passage has been that the true messenger of Christ is not burdensome to a congregation, whereas the false prophet, the false teacher, is. So let's go on. The third time I am ready to come to you, Verse 14, this is the third time I'm ready to come to you. I don't know whether he tried for three times to go or whether he actually went three times uh, to Corinth. I don't have any idea. Absolutely uh, no idea at all. I think he went to Corinth three times, but it's entirely possible. I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. I have no way to prove it. I simply point out in passing, I think that when he's talking here, He's ready, Paul is ready to go the third time to Corinth. He's been there twice before. If you don't agree with that, well, you're not disagreeing with much because I don't know what I'm talking about. Look what he says in the 14th verse. I'm coming a third time. Man, not just once or twice, but a third time I'm coming to you. Some churches he, he never got to three times. And when I come again, I'm still not going to be burdensome. I'm still not going to be any different the third time than it, I, it, I was the last time, two times. For I don't seek yours, I seek you. Man, that is a devastating statement. I believe that's a, uh, a violent contrast with the activity of those who were false prophets. They were seeking what the people had. 
Paul was seeking the people. I do not seek yours but you, he says. For the children are not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. I quoted that verse to my father hundreds of times. And I never realized until I studied it that I was putting a burden on my father. The verse indicates that the children should not lay up for the parents. And the word children means child. I didn't understand that verse when I was using it against my father. The idea there is that these are not adult children, that Paul had a responsibility to the young believers at Corinth that was similar to the responsibility of a parent who has young children. A, uh, a child should not go out and support the parent. That child has every right, dearly beloved, to expect responsibility to be exhibited on the part of the parent. Nobody in their right mind would expect an eight-year-old kid to exercise the sense of responsibility that an, that an adult should. And that's what the passage is saying. You believers at Corinth are like young children. You have the right to expect from me, your spiritual mentor or father, you have the right to expect from me what any child has the right to expect from their parents under a normal condition. You should not be providing for me spiritually. I should be providing for you. I don't seek your physical benefits or wealth or, or whatever it might be. I seek you. And there the spiritual tone of the passage is that when I come back, there isn't going to be any burden placed on you. I'm functioning in the position of a spiritual father. Now, dearly beloved, listen to me. I want you to realize that we're looking at the Word. We're looking at the Lord Jesus Christ. That verse becomes absolutely startling when we recognize that God Himself is putting Himself on record as saying, you shouldn't lay up for me, I ought to lay up for you. I, God, am your Father, you are my children. I'm probably not going to say this very well, but I believe that's almost contrary to much of the messages that I hear today. It's as though we ought to be doing for God when God is saying here, listen, I have shouldered the responsibility of, of your, your father, and you have the right to expect from me what any child would expect from a father. You know, we, we, we sing the songs and, and we proclaim the truth that God is our Heavenly Father, but we don't really much live it. And fo folks, I want you to see in the verse much more than an, an illustration of how a man 2,000 years or, ago or so named Paul lived his life, but rather a Commitment by God Almighty to function toward us as a father would function toward his young children. That's what I want you to see. First words ever sent over the telegraph. A portion of a verse of scripture. Look what God has wrought. Isn't that amazing? And if you look at that date, the date I listed for that, that first scriptural telegraph message was sent on Pentecost. Just go look it up. What great things has God done for this people as bringing them out of the land of Egypt? Let's see, uh, we can go down the list here. Heading, heading, uh, heading them across the desert, leading them through the Red Sea, feeding them, uh, supplying for them, keeping them, you know, protecting them. You know, from their enemies there, expelling the inhabitants of the land of Canaan and settling them there in their place. What wonderful things has God done for His spiritual Israel in the redemption of them by Christ and in the beginning and carrying out the, the work of grace upon their hearts by the, by the Spirit where at last He'll bring them all uh, 
to the heavenly Canaan of rest and, and happiness. That's the context of Numbers 23, 23, what, 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 God, what God has wrought. That is, God did it. We didn't. It's not about us at all. It's not about us. Folks, it's not about us. What has God wrought? In other words, look at what God has done. Dearly beloved, this is the context of 2 Corinthians 12. This is the heart of this ministry, Blessed Hope Forever. It's about Him, not us. And that, dear friends, was the heart of the first telegraph message sent in 1844. Look at what God has, has wrought. Dearly beloved, I, every video I make, I'm trying to get you folks to look at what God has done. We are so focused on what we, we must do, we think that we must do, or what we ought to do, and, and what one, one another ought to do. Folks, our attention is always to be directed toward Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. We love you all. We truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.